Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. A note on process public art panel discussion with Amy Lam, Ronaldo Walcott, Justin Key, um, moderated by myself, Annie Wong, and Heather Rigg. Before we begin, for our visually impaired and low vision audience members, um, what you have on your screen are five Zoom boxes. Speaking is Annie Wong. I am a uh, Asian woman, femme identifying, wearing a yellow sweater with black hair and behind me is a floral wallpaper that's blue and white. Amy, would you like to describe yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Amy Lam, and I'm an East Asian woman in my late 30s. And I have short black hair. I'm wearing headphones. And I'm sitting on the floor in front of a white couch. Ronaldo? Should I go next? Okay. So my name is Ronaldo Walcott. I'm a black man. I identify, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I have on one side of my head, um, long shoulder length dreadlocks. The other side is shaved. I'm wearing um, silver frame glasses. And behind me are um, a section of the bookshelves in my home office. Hi, my name is Jesse McKee, um, and I'm a white man in his late 30s. I have um, dark brown hair that's about shoulder length, but it's pushed back by because I'm wearing a pair of um, headphones, and I have uh, gray hair on my temples. Um, I'm sitting in my home office, and in a, in a black office chair and um, behind me is a, a white wall. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Heather Rigg. I'm the curatorial resident at Gallery TPW. Um, I'm a brown woman of Southeast Asian descent. Um, I have black hair. I'm wearing a white shirt and white headphones, gold earrings. And I'm sitting in the gallery office, which is white, a white room with bookshelves and one framed photo on the wall. Gallery TPW would like to acknowledge that it is located on Treaty 13 territory, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We live, work, and create on these stolen territories that are part of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, an agreement that reminds us that we all share the same bowl and spoon Therefore, we must take only what we need to allow for continued abundance and future viability. Colonial thinking and systems are premised on the opposite of the dish with one spoon law, foregrounding extractivist greed, individualism, and capital gain. The stolen indigenous territories that we inhabit are surveilled and policed by these forces. As settlers, as art workers, as an artist-run center, how can we unlearn Eurocentric ways of knowing and existing? Today we are speaking about public art and access and control to what is referred to as quote, public space. We would like to close this land acknowledgement by asking, how can we strive to dismantle colonial systems of violence, that, violence and theft in order to center community, sustainability and the sharing of resources, thereby upholding our part in the dish with the one spoon law. Gallery TPW would like to thank all of you for joining us today, and we'd like to thank, um, we'd like to send some extended thank yous to ESN Moss Park, Indu Vashist, Shani K. Parsons, who curated the Parquet projects and who unfortunately could not join us today, as well as to Max Lester. Um, all of these folks were very informative and helpful in the production of this forum and the Parquet projects. I'd also like to extend uh, thanks for everyone joining us today and the panelist here. I'm really excited to open this conversation that we at TPW have been having internally for some time with the rest of the community. A note on process, public art brings together artist Amy Lam, 
221A Head of Strategy, Jesse McKee and scholar Ronaldo Walcott to explore public space in the triangulation of policing, gentrification and counter power. The panel will include presentations from each speaker followed by a Q&A moderated by Heather and myself and then open to the audience. The event will run until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10.30 uh, a.m. Pacific Time. It is closed captioning made available via Zoom and the video will be recorded. Um, but before we begin, Heather and I would like to give some context as to why we were compelled to program this panel and our intention to host a conversation about public art. Prior to the pandemic, Toronto Mayor um, John Tory proclaimed 2021 as a year of public art, ushering 10 years of fund, a 10 year funding commitment to support public art. This policy is not unique in the history of Toronto's cultural strategies. In 2003, Mayor David Miller launched a cultural plan for a creative city, which saw robust investments and in renovations to large institutions and public art infrastructures. The city's agenda was to position, quote unquote, creative industries as the economic engine of Toronto, a then burgeoning global city. The cultural plan was on one hand commemorated for infusing the cultural sector, the creative sector with much needed resources. And on the other hand was heavily criticized as state sanctioned gentrification of working class neighborhoods under the pretense of urban renewal. Today, as we enter a year of public art branded by Artwork TO and a city punctuated with spectacular and poignant works of art from our peers and friends and community, artists and artist run centers find themselves in a similar predicament from 10 years ago. However, now in a state of the pandemic and in the midst of a housing crisis, the dilemma of supporting valuable artistic work at the service of a cultural policy's neoliberal agenda are entangled within the mechanisms of the carceral state that 10 years ago was less foregrounded. This year, Gallery TPW received funding from Artwork TO to produce the Parquet Projects, guest carried by Shani K. Parsons. As Parson describes, featuring six newly commissioned performances and temporary, temporary uh, installations, the Parquet Projects probe existing tensions and future potentials for poetic and political relations between self, body, site, and society across a shifting urban landscape, end quote. The projects were presented in the aftermath of the city's deployment of private security and police officers who violently evicted encampments occupied by the unhoused in various public parts across the city. Nearly $2 million was spent on this violent campaign, described by the city as an effort to, quote unquote, restore public space after receiving pressure from nearby property owners. While working on the Parquet projects, our process included thinking about the ethical entanglements of participating in a municipal led initiative that holds an adjacent agenda of catalyzing gentrification with displays of paramilitary force while supporting the impactful and thoughtful artistic interventions realized through the Parquet projects. Um, our, our thinking and our council included seeking counsel with the community this past spring. We connected with Indu Vashist, the executive director of the Artist Run Center SAVAC, who supports and volunteers with ESN and through our conversations with them inspired this panel. We also worked closely with Shani Parsons, the curator, and consulted with artistic practitioners also involved in ESN. Our impetus was to learn how to meaningfully support the unhoused community beyond our solidarity statement. And in learning what ESN Moss Park needed this past spring when we were in talks with them, we allocated $3,000 of our year of public art programming funds to support their work. Today, we've invited Amy, Ronaldo, and Jesse to further our conversation and to explore the following questions. What strategies can artists and artist run centers employ to respond to the political realities that intersect with our work? And how can art reclaim public space when it is weaponized as property of the state? And Ronaldo, Jesse, and Amy, we're delighted to have you here today. So thank you for joining us. Um, I believe Annie's going to introduce Amy.
Oh, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, you going for a um, thank you so much, Amy, for joining us. Amy Lam is an artist and writer. She has shown projects internationally, both solo and part of the art collected Life of a Craphead. She's a member of Friends of Chinatown Toronto, a grassroots group fighting against displacement and for racial justice in Toronto's West Chinatown. Her poetry chapbook, The Four Onions, 2021, is available from Yokos Press. Joining us from Toronto, Ronaldo Walcott is the director of the Women and Gender Studies Institute and is an associate professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. His research initiatives explore Black diaspora cultural studies, gender, and sexuality. Today, Ronaldo will discuss his 2021 publication On Property, which traces the historical trajectory of slave ownership to private property today. In the book, he points to an anti-colonial and communal approach to land use and rights. The idea of the commons brings with it a different kind of ethical order and an abolitionist consciousness that demands a different type, a different relationship to property as the foundation for transformation. And joining us this morning from Vancouver, Jesse McKee is a curator of contemporary art and design and is the head of strategy at the Vancouver-based institution 221A. He will be discussing how 221A shifted from a gallery focused exhibition model to an institution capable of context rich research that leads towards the development of emergent cultural, social, and ecological infrastructures. Amy, we'll turn things over to you. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm really excited to be on this panel with Ronaldo and with Walcott, with Annie and Heather. Um, so today I'm going to speak about my project for the Parquets project, which is titled Uncom Unofficial Commemorative Bench, and I'm going to talk about um, my process and how it led to um, what the project is now. So when I was first invited to participate in the Parquets project, um, I was immediately drawn to one parquet um, in Toronto's West Chinatown, which is the Glasgow Street Parquet. This is a photo of the Glasgow Street Parquet. And I was drawn to it because of the way that it looks, which is unusual for a parquet. Most of the parquets in Toronto don't look like this. Uh, Glasgow Street has this design and amenities which look uh, expensive, basically. And um, one of the other reasons why I was drawn to this site was because it's Glasgow Street is a laneway in Chinatown and you can only access it through um, one street, which is Cecil Street. And it ends in a dead end. Um, and the houses in it look on it look like this. I used to live in a laneway in Kensington Market. So um, I was kind of familiar with this type of um, architecture in the neighborhood. And through my research, I discovered that the renovation of the parquet was the result of a long struggle between neighborhood residents and a development that's at the north end of the street. So this is a photo of the back end of that development. Um, and the development is a tower, which is 24 stories tall, so obviously the tower extends much further than the frame allows us to see. Um, and the development is called Campus One. So Campus One is a privately owned student residence, which is owned by a company called Nightstone Capital Management. Um, it's affiliated with U of T, but it's not owned or operated by U of T. Uh, it's a for-profit residence. And one of the reasons why it's affiliated with U of T is that the land that it's on is quote owned by U of T and also U of T operates meal plans in this building. As of July, 2021, it costs around $2,000 to rent a studio apartment in Campus One that doesn't have a kitchen and doesn't have living space. So 
I don't know, I guess basically has a bed and maybe a desk. Um, and when you rent this apartment, you're then forced to enter into a meal plan with the U of T uh, meal plan, I don't even know what to call it, meal plan service or whatever. And it costs about $6,000 for uh, to purchase the meal plan for two semesters. One of the things about this meal plan is that you can only eat at the cafeteria at Campus One. So even though it's a U of T meal plan, you can't actually eat or use that money towards other locations at U of T. Um, so you can't even eat at like the building across the street or whatever. When this building, Campus One, was first proposed um, in 2010, 2011, it was proposed to be a 42 story tower which is approximately 10 times over the zoning guidelines for that strip of College Street. So immediately it caused a lot of opposition from residence groups in the neighborhood, including people who lived on Glasgow Street, as well as other associations like the Grange Community Association. Um, at the time, most of the residents on Glasgow Street were Chinese families. Um, and I spoke to someone who lived on the street and was part of the opposition against this development, um, who told me that it was mostly Toishanese families and many of them were multi-generational. Uh, so the person I spoke to lived with her parents um, in, in as one of these houses on Glasgow Street. Prior to Glasgow Street being a home for mostly Chinese families, um, it was home to many Jewish workers in the neighborhood um, in the earlier end of the 20th century. So the residents of Glasgow Street um, and other people from uh, the neighborhood associations that I mentioned earlier, basically got together to fight this development, to oppose the development. And at the time, the city, um, you know, because it was so far over the zoning guidelines, the city also opposed it. And the developer was forced to come back with a revised proposal, which was for 24 stories, which is still five times over that zoning guideline. Um, and the developer ended up taking the plan or the proposal for the development in order to kind of circumvent the, circumvent the city's planning department they went to a body that's, that was known as the Ontario Municipal Board um, or the OMB. And the OMB is, I'm sure if you live in Toronto, you've probably heard about it. It's notorious because it's a provincial body that developers can go to to basically get any plan that they want approved. It's developer friendly and it's a, the main reason why lots of um, the that's the main reason why lots of city planning in Toronto is so weak because there's this other body that developers can go to. Um, the OMB is now currently known as the uh, Land Appeal Planning Tribunal, so the LPAT. So you might hear people talk about the LPAT. Um, anyway, so the developer went to the OMB and the neighbors, the people who lived on Glasgow Street and the other resident associations got together to oppose it. I think something that's notable is when I was talking to people who were part of this, um, they mentioned that the city wasn't really of much help and it really was the residents coming together um, in order to fight this at the OMB. And opposing something at the OMB means like hiring lawyers and hiring architects to come up with arguments for what you propose what you um, present to the tribunal. So it costs money and it takes a long time um, and it's very taxing. Um, so the neighbors and the community associations didn't just go to the OMB and say like, we don't want the development. They actually, you know, landed on the side of, okay, we're gonna try and propose like modifications to the proposal. So they even drew up a plan for an alternate 12 story building instead. Um, and what happened ultimately was that the OMB ruled on the side of the developers and the developer didn't have to make any changes. The 24 story building as they wanted went forward um, and that was it. 
when I talked to people who were involved in this fight at the OMB, they described it in ways which were like, it was devastating and that it was one of the worst things that they had ever encountered in any of their experience being on neighborhood associations or being involved in any of the city planning things. Um, it was very notable how unanimous that was just in terms of people being really upset by the process and by how they didn't feel that supported by the city and how the developer was very, um, yeah, callous and really unwilling to negotiate or hear anything from them. Um, another thing I want to point out is that at the time, even some U of T student groups opposed this residence um, because they made the argument that why is a student residence being owned and operated by a private for-profit developer? Um, arguments which were just you know, ignored or dismissed by the OMB adjudicator. So as part of this um, decision that the OMB made, a Section 37 agreement was made. So a Section 37 agreement um, permits the City of Toronto, this is a quote from the City of Toronto website, permits the city to authorize increases in height or density in return for community benefits. And these Section 37 agreements are used all over the place in many developments. Um, and as part of the Section 37 uh, agreement for this development, which was in the amount of a million dollars, uh, about a third of that went towards the renovation of this parquet. So the way the parquet looks is because of the tower. It's a very direct uh, relationship. Um, and in these Section 37 developments, you know, there's this number that was somehow came, you know, calculated a million dollars, but there's no transparency or even requirement to calculate how much more profit the developer is making by being allowed to build, you know, five times over the, the zoning guidelines. Um, what that's calculated on is some formula for land value, but it's never calculated according to like, well, the developer, you know, is going to get 30 more, not 30, <laughs> it's only 24 stories, but like 15 more stories. So there's X number of apartments, they're charging $2,000 per apartment. This building is going to be here for, you know, 100 years or something. This is how much profit that the developer will make. There's, there's nothing like that. Um, and these Section 37 or community benefits agreements also don't take into account the long-term effects of what a development like this will have in the neighborhood and in the city. And I think you can see the long-term effects of Campus One um, very clearly. And in 2019, which was about two years after Campus One opened, um, there was a proposal that was put forward in Chinatown, in West Chinatown. This is the Campus One website if you wanna visit. Um, it's kind of entertaining. <laughs> um, but so in 2019, there was a proposal in Toronto's Chinatown at 315 Spadina, which is this block where uh, Ding Dong Bakery um, and other businesses reside. And the developers wanted to build a 13 story rental building. And as part of my work with Friends of Chinatown Toronto, we opposed this development proposal and uh, we engaged in uh, in some of the city consultations and some of the working group processes that the city, you know, has around developments like this. Um, and what's interesting is that in the planning rationale for 315 Spadina, this new development, they reference Campus One, which is here in the middle of the screen. I think actually they got the number wrong, 26 story, but they reference it as one of the developments which um, makes acceptable more developments in Chinatown. They basically say like, there's all these developments around the neighborhood already, like, you know, what's the big deal? Um, and in this new development at 315 Spadina, they also in the initial plans proposed an interior layout that would be similar to the Campus One layout. So they proposed a lot of studio apartments 
um, and some which they call double studios, which is really funny, but basically in the plan, it would be like two beds in one room. So dorm style, which is obviously clearly targeted towards students. Um, I forgot to say earlier too that you actually don't need to be a student to live at Campus One. So I emailed them, you know, inquiring about what it would take to live there. And they said, no, you don't have to be U of T student or any kind of full time student. Um, so there's the possibility that this style of housing without kitchen space and without living space could be for anyone. Um, and coming back to this proposal on Spadina um, in 2019, which I think is obviously relevant for this panel, is that when they proposed this building, um, this is straight from the developer's um, deck, they offered as a community benefit, which would be funded through Section 37, this uh, character uh, community involvement mural slash installation and so this is their rendering of what a mural could be on this building um, as i guess a gesture towards the the, the local community and so you know through um yeah through all of this process and and research what I came to in terms of my project was wanting to make something that would mark this relationship between the tower and the park. And I think it's a history that's at once very obvious in the sense that the tower is 24 stories and blocks the view from the park, um, but one that is also completely buried. And the way that I wanted to go about it was through an existing program at the city of Toronto, which is called um, the commemorative bench program. And usually it's a program that's used for people to make like commemorations to their loved ones who have passed away. And the reason why I was attracted to this program is because unlike other, you know, kind of public artworks that the city wants artists to make just for two months or for a year, like temporary things, it's something that the city actually maintains once you pay them to make it. So you can pay them $2,000, they'll make a bench for you and they'll maintain it for up to 10 years. Um, it used to be forever, but they scaled back. So now it's only 10 years. Um, but I got rejected from the program, I think because of the renovation, because the park, um, this is a picture of Glasgow Street Parkette in the past. But I think I got rejected because of the way that the benches are now. Um, and so as I was trying to figure out what to do after having been rejected from the program, I was also during this period, I was also visiting the park um, and trying to make contact with someone who was living in the park at the time. So there's one person who's living in the park at, um, in a tent. And the day that I finally managed to meet him, he, was sitting on one of these benches completely despondent because at six in the morning that day, the city had come in and thrown all his shit away and just trashed it. And, and he was really upset. And yeah, it was, it's like, this was in May, 2021. This was before the kind of major evictions that happened at Trinity Bellwoods and Lamport and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have words for the city doing this kind of thing. Um, and so after meeting him, I decided that, you know, it didn't make sense for me to engage with the city further because I didn't want to bring more attention to this parquet. And also the person who was living there was really intent on staying there. He really wanted to be there. And I didn't want to bring more city staff um, to come to the park or have any other reason for them to try to come back and throw away their stuff again or his stuff again. Um, so I installed these plaques unofficially and the text um, on them reads, to recognize the efforts of the people who tried to stop the tower at the north end of the street. And it also says the same thing in a translation in uh, traditional Chinese. And um, 
the text on these plaques, I um, was actually talking to the person who lived in the park about them and he gave me some feedback. So he's the reason why it says to recognize instead of to commemorate because he was like to commemorate sounds like the people have died. And I was like, you're totally right. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll end it there. And just to note that um, the person who's living there doesn't live there anymore. Um, he ended up moving out like uh, a, a month or so after the city came and threw all his stuff away. He did get a new tent, but um, yeah, I think there's too much pressure from the neighbors and from the park staff for him to kind of be there. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if I went a bit over time, I'm sorry, but um, I'm happy to talk more in the in the after in the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Um, just to repeat, my name is Ronaldo Walcott and I go by he, him, and I'm wearing a black hoodie um, today. It's a real um, pleasure to be speaking with Emily and Jesse this afternoon, um, given the tremendous work that, um, that they're doing to help us to rethink public space. And indeed, what I'm gonna talk about um, my my last little book um, on property um, very much a lot of my thinking in this work um, is informed by questions of public space and um, and and it's ongoing reconfiguration into into multiple forms of property and into um, private property in particular um and and if i might take a minute i just want to say emily thank you so much for the work of unmasking what the university of toronto is doing by exercising its real estate portfolio um there's a certain my name's kind amy of, sorry sorry, I'm sorry amy. to interrupt <laughs> yeah sorry. I just, no it's okay <laughs> thank you okay. yeah i apologize amy there's been a profound silence among many on the St. George campus about the exercise of that real estate portfolio that the university quote unquote owns. And we should not be surprised that our current president is an urban geographer who has been um, a consultant and a so-called expert um, to many municipal governments in so-called global cities, that he rose into that position at a time when Toronto was, has been undergoing a significant um, remaking of property and private property through um, development should not surprise anyone. And if you take a look at the biographies of the people on the, uh, on the governing council, the highest um, governing body at the University of Toronto, you would really begin to see how a number of these things are coming together. And so the kinds of concerns that I'm interested in in my book on property also is very much um, informed or has consequences for the kinds of um, ideas and issues that, that you share with us, Amy. So on property is really a, a long essay that um, is organized around three interrelated moments. The first is that this, this thing that we now, that we call abolition is part of a long black radical tradition. And that what we call abolition today is very much in relationship to the first and most important significant abolition movement, which was the, the movement to end both the trade in African bodies and to end um, the enslavement of African black people in the Americas and wherever else it was occurring. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that that, first abolitionist movement 
um, that resulted in the emancipation of people who were enslaved, whether in the US, Canada, the Anglo-Caribbean, um, Brazil, Cuba, and so on, that that first abolitionist movement um, resulted in emancipation, but not freedom. And therefore emancipation is simply um, uh, one moment in a continued struggle for um, abolition and for a transformation of the world as um, colonial practices and processes have shaped it. And then the third moment of the book is for us to think about the structural arrangements of contemporary life in which Black and, partic and particularly Black and Indigenous people seem to be the first order of. So Black and Indigenous people are the first order of these ongoing histories of colonial violence, but we are not the last order. That indeed, um, these practices and processes, they move across communities. Um, but Black and Indigenous people represent the first order for a particular reason. So, but it's those three kind of broad ideas that holds the argument together in the book. But underlying those three ideas are, um, are what holds this kind of colonial logic and its longevity in place are a set of institutions, a set of institutions that um, collectively we have made legitimate, but in many ways are fundamentally illegitimate and therefore we use the language of abolition to say that we should transform them, that we can do better, that we can reorganize um, life differently. And among those institutions are of course, so-called representative government in all of its multiple levels, from the federal to the provincial to the municipal and so on. The ways in which um, formal education and formal schooling works, um, especially and importantly universities, because universities are one of the central places in which the kinds of ideas that legitimate how to organize life are generated and, ex and experimented with and then proceed to shape larger, larger public spheres. Museums, another significant institution that holds the legitimacy of colonial logics in place, and of course, police and prisons. And so when we talk about abolition, one of the things that we're talking about is the transformation of an entire system of networks of institutions that currently govern and organize our lives in ways that reproduce the ongoing network violences of white supremacist capitalism. So that white supremacist capitalism then is not simply um, you, know, the, the, you know, the hatred of non-white people, but it's the very cultural apparatus that has been built to hold um, the practices of subordination and exclusion and, illegit and, and making others illegitimate in place. And those structures are adaptive enough and persuasive enough that even people of color can help to animate those structures. So when we talk about abolition, we're not simply talking about the dismantling of, of the dismantling and the moving of people marked as white out of positions of power. We're also talking about the manner in which we have built structures and processes within those structures that reproduces the logic and the practice of white supremacy, regardless of who might be actually sitting in the particular chair, in the particular office, holding the particular key to the city, um, who might be the prime minister and so on. So it's really important to understand that abolition as a philosophical intervention, as a political practice, as an activist demand, is about an entire transformation, or as Bill Wilson Gilmore would say, it's about changing everything, right? So how do we arrive here? I said earlier that one of the things that holds my argument together is the idea that there's the structural arrangements of Black and Indigenous on freedom, on the rights 
um, this colonial project. And of course, one of the ways in which it underwrites the colonial project is that, for example, Black people were bought into the Americas, not simply as labor, but also as commodity. So their literal bodies were owned by others, and then those bodies were put to work, um, put into labor. So the kind of question then of bodily autonomy, owning one's body, continues to be a central feature of Black life in the contemporary era. And this question then of owning our bodies is one that often meets its most brutal confrontation in policing. That when Black people move around, when Black people just live lives, when police intervenes, you really see the confrontation with the fact that there's still an underlying logic that Black people don't get to own their bodies, that all kinds of external forces get to own their bodies. And so this is why policing marks one of the most um, significant moments uh, for us to notice how um, freedom works in the world. For indigenous people, the question of land and land theft gets worked out in the contemporary era on their bodies too. That there are very survival, black and indigenous, the survival of black and indigenous people are very survival marks and both marks an affront to ongoing colonial logics, but it also marks the fact that they have not been totally successful. And because they have not been totally successful in both using and eradicating us, modern policing, prisons, and a whole range of discourses around comportment, how we dress, how we carry ourselves, how we speak, what constitutes our cultures, come into place to continually attempt to delegitimize our lives, right? And so the, the violence that abolition seeks to abolish is a continuum of violence. It can be anything as mild as the way you speak English, your accent makes me not be able to understand you to as extreme as police shooting people down on the street in, the, in their back, right? And so these violences underpin the white supremacist claim of its own legitimacy in relationship to what it calls civilization. And so, you know, abolition then is an attempt to not only give us a language to name that continuing colonial violence, but it's also an attempt to give us a, a philosophy of how we might begin to think about what it means to remake that violence. And of course, one way that we begin to think about how we can remake that violence, and this is what I suggest in the book is that we return to a notion of a, new, a renewed commons. And by that part of what I'm trying to get at is that um, the question of how we share all of, all of the earth resources and how we think about also the invented resources that now shape contemporary human life. So for instance, we're still in the midst of a pandemic and one of the invented resources that will be absolutely imperative to the longevity of life on the planet would be the shared patents of the vaccines. And yet the wealthy West continues to hoard those patents. Um, as a way then of being able to distribute who gets to live and who gets to die. But a renewed commons would see not just the earth's natural resources that we are radically depleting and abusing um, be shared by all of us, but it will also require that we share all of these other invented technologies and resources that now supposedly are to make um, human life um, much more livable if you will. And so, and this kind of idea then strikes at the heart of the, of the twin notion of white supremacy, which is the white supremacy is not just about a rank order of racial legitimacy in relationship to who gets to live and who gets to die, but white supremacy also has as its twin capitalism, racial capitalism, in which the question of unequal distribution shapes who has access 
to live in what kinds of lives, to live in what we might consider a good life. Taken together then, white, supremacist, white supremacist racial capitalism has distorted and maldistributed the commons. In fact, what it has done is it has enclosed the commons and turned it into private property by and large. And so in my book, the argument is that we have to abolish property if we are ever able to achieve a commons that might be transformative for how we might live better together. Now, one of the things that I wanna say about making an argument like that is that we can see all of the many ways in which, and I think Amy's presentation so beautifully did this, we can see all the ways in which this kind of logic of property, not just owning our bodies, but the, the maldistribution of land and resources is continually being um, constricted and restricted. And by doing that, what it does is it breaks us away from sharing and building around collective concerns into looking out for ourselves as individuals. One of the most powerful things that the neoliberal revolution has done has not been in the realm of the economic. It has actually been in the realm of the cultural to make us all believe that we're responsible for our individual selves. What abolition does is it rewrites that narrative and says, no, we're not responsible for our individual selves. We are responsible for our collective selves. And to be responsible for our collective selves, it means that we're going to have to find other ways of organizing human life and sharing the resources that we need among ourselves to live the best possible lives that we can live. I'm gonna conclude by this because I know you guys have some questions for us and it will allow me to, to, to speak more directly. This, I'm wearing my hoodie today for a particular reason. I didn't share my screen because, you know, if you're in Toronto, you've, you've probably went by the AGO or what, but, and, and saw this as part of the, the Public Artworks TO series. This past summer um, or late summer, I went to, to the AGO to see the Fragments of Epic Memory show. And as I exited, um, I went to the, um, the cafe at the AGO that was situated on, on the sidewalk there. And I had forgotten entirely about this public art thing. And then I looked over and I saw Thomas J. Price's magnificent um, sculpture and statue of an oversized big black man wearing a hoodie title within the folds. And, you know, what that evoked for me was a couple of things, but the one that I want to conclude with here for us to think about is that in the moment where the intensification of public space becomes more privatized, that the manner in which public art, public art can play a role in bringing back a particular kind of presence, but that presence is actually double-edged. So the, the downtown core of Toronto has been radically emptied out of black people, right? But we can return through these kinds of public art projects, public art projects that in another moment, the big black man in the hoodie becomes dangerous and subjected to from, you know, slight, slight, slights of violence to tremendous physical violence and harm. And it is in fact this kind of dilemma that we find ourselves in in contemporary culture. And the kind, and this is the kind of questions that I'm trying to work out in my own work. When we get into the conversation, I will give some examples from the, the built environment and the way in which um, the built environment is continually being eroded from us and turned into um, and turned into um, private space. So thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Great. 
Thank you, Ronaldo and Amy. Um, how much, Annie and Heather, how much time do we have left before we should jump into the conversation? I just want to make sure so I can self-edit the presentation if need be. We have about 10 minutes left. 10 Great. Okay. Minutes. Great. Let me just pull up my deck. Can everyone see that? 221A logo? Okay, great. So thank you for having me. Um, calling in from Vancouver this morning. So thank you, Ronaldo and Amy and Heather and Annie for giving me the context of, of, of Ta Toronto and um, what's going on on the ground there. I haven't been for many, many years. I haven't been since 2018, I don't think. So it was good to, to, to hear from you about the, the incredible work that you both do. Um, so I'm, I work at 221A, which is an art center a nonprofit in, um, in, in, in Vancouver. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you might know us as an artist-run center like TPW, but I'd say we have many doors. Um, and you knocked on the artist-run center door, and we're going to go in through that door. But I think you'll find a lot of other different kind of people and projects going on under 221A's hood. Because like Ronaldo had said, I think it's important to acknowledge that the extensions of white supremacy exist in the museum, exist in the university, they exist in the artist run center model, which is an extension of the Canada Council for the Arts, essentially. Um, so I think what's important to know about 221A is that, um, is that you know, we um, come out of Vancouver's Chinatown, our um, and our the it was initiated as initially through um a group of students at Emily Carr University, um, and they were predominantly international students of um, East Asian and South Asian kind of descent. Um, the two co-founders who are still with us at 221A were really glad that they have made it, have been keep doing it all these years. It's Brian McBay and Michelle Fu. Um, Brian McBay is our executive director, and Michelle Fu is our um, head of um, head of uh, equity and finance. And um, they actually just welcomed their very first child, a, a daughter named An Yi. So that's our new hope at 221A. Um, so Ani just celebrated her um, 100 days um, earlier this month. So we're all very uh, much looking forward to meeting her soon um, when the pandemic will allow. And that's kind of 221A's new hope. But then in 2007, once the kind of cohort had graduated, they'd found a space in Chinatown where Brian's family had business um, relationships um, for many, many generations. And they just started sharing a space and kind of doing exhibitions in the front and kind of the de facto model for what that was in Canada was called the Artist Run Center. And then they said, oh, you can apply to the Canada Council to get supported to do this. Um, and what was also interesting about us is that we think about art and design. So not just, so we're able to kind of interrogate urban design in some ways. Um, but, you know, that Artist Run Center model never quite fit what 221A was trying to do because really, you know, Brian and Michelle and the other founders of 221A kind of really saw the network of Chinese benevolent societies in the neighborhood as really our elders um, and not so much places like the Or Gallery, Art Speak, or the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, and so, you know, really to when is interested in trying to think about how do you hold this space? Um, how do you kind of support the intangible cultural heritage of this, of this neighborhood? Um, and how do you develop a better commons going forward? Um, so, our vision is actually for all people to have the means to make and access culture, um, which really does kind of apply to the commons. But I think it's also, um, uh, sorry, I'll just kind of talk about the image, which you see is a garden path and in the center of it um, is kind of a, um, a fireplace with a bench. Um, and there's two workers from the downtown east side just kind of taking a break um, and relaxing in that space. And that space is known as the, the Hao Shui, um, which is a, which is a, um, the, which is a Squamish term for, for the new growth or in Cantonese, the space is known as Song Song Lum. Um, and it was it was designed by um, uh, Toits Tanat Sis Weiss, who is an indigenous uh, ethnobotanist and artist, um, who is of Squamish, um, Stolo, uh, Hawaiian, and uh, Swiss descent. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But where we're at now in 2022. One, um, so we're a not-for-profit cultural R&D organization. We're with artists and designers to research and develop social, cultural, and ecological infrastructure, and we're on the unceded and unsurrendered territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and uh, Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, the city is also known as Vancouver. And so, when we think about property, I think it's important to think about this. Um, many dimensions and um, you know on the right you can kind of see this diagram that comes from uh, the McConnell Foundation and their work through a group called Civic Indigenous 7.0 um, 
So this is something that we're paying attention to very much in our city, um, because as you know, in 2014, Vancouver, the city of Vancouver itself declared itself on unceded indigenous land. Um, but they left a really big gap for culture, for civic society, for the business community to kind of figure out what that means. They didn't quite tell us. Um, and so there's a lot of contestation and negotiation on what this means and how to go forward. Um, we're seeing many things come out of it, but what I think is important to note in some of the work coming out of civic indigenous um, is that Indigenous law consists of legal orders which are rooted in Indigenous societies themselves. It arises from Indigenous nations across the country and may include relationships to the land, the spirit world, certain creation stories, customs, processes of deliberation and persuasion, codes of conduct, rules, teachings, and axioms for living and governing. And that definition comes from JFK Law Corporation, which is an Indigenous law firm um, here in British Columbia. Um, and so, and then on the left, there's just this meme here from an internet community I'm part of called New Models. But so where we started, this might be the 20th century conception of the land, but unfortunately we're in the 21st century. Um, so the kind of, you know, that enclosure comes from above more than it's coming from below these days um, from the state. And so, you know, I think it's important to think about when you talk about the city, the city is no longer a, ser a series of interconnected neighborhoods with high streets and communities and, and these sorts of ways of belonging, but it's also now a site of global financial operation and extraction. And so 221A is very much trying to engage with the city at this scale and trying to think about different operational modes um, that we can get into. So our cultural sector is at risk here. Um, this isn't a study that we did, but this is coming from the Eastside Cultural Crawl. So we're not just thinking about the public square or the plaza, um, but also thinking about what the class position of artists in this city is or what designers, uh, what their class position is in this city and how they relate to making it a more livable and a, a, like a better recommoned or a better common place. Um, but you know, we can't really do that if we don't have living and working space as a sector and as a community ourselves. Um, so, you know, since the Olympics in 2010, we've lost about 400,000 square feet of studio space across all disciplines. Um, and what remains in there, 83% of it is um, at risk of displacement. So it is a highly fragile sector. Um, we have approximately the same property values. However, in Vancouver, it's much more endemic because we have a much lower um, income than Toronto does across the board. So in Vancouver, like it's comparable that in the city that we'd have the property values of the Bay Area, Palo Alto, but yet we would have the incomes of a place like Columbus, Ohio. So the gap between what you need to afford to live here is much greater. And then there's nowhere greater in North America than in Vancouver. Um, also thinking about the city, um, we're experiencing another atmospheric river today. The video on the top uh, right with the container or uh, sorry, barge and the cyclist was taken last Monday. As our seawall was being flooded, that barge was set loose and it's crashed up against the beach and it still lives there. Um, you can see that what the water rising levels will look like in various different temperature configurations for the city. And so the land is disappearing at the same time. And then on the bottom left is um, Yayo Kusama's uh, pumpkin from Naoshima Island in Japan that was washed away um, earlier this year in, in floods as well. So we have to think about the city as this, this site of, um, as, as, as kind of coming crisis and kind of coming kind of climate catastrophe as well. The interior of the province is currently feeling this. Um, we are still disconnected by road and rail from the rest of the country in Vancouver. So uh, we're like an island as a city in some ways, except we, we can connect with, with um, the South, with the US, with Washington State and Oregon right now, um, which is where a lot of supplies are coming in. So our thinking at 221A is trying to think about the city through this lens of what's known as the Anthropocene back loop. And that comes from a scholar, um, an urban studies scholar named Stephanie Wakefield, who was working in Miami, which made her think about similar things that we're thinking about, but she's really recently relocated to teach in Marietta, Georgia. Um, but essentially the Anthropocene back loop is the period of an ecosystem when the back loop is the ecosystem when it breaks down, when new actors, when new forces, when new energies are introduced in this ecosystem, it gives birth to the new one. And so essentially um, what she's done in a text from last year um, called the Anthropocene Back Loop Experiments in Unsafe Operating Space is kind of looking at this phase of um, reorganization, conservation, release and exploitation that is kind of organic to ecosystems, but then applied it to human society. And so if we're looking at the 20th century, the century that most of us were born in probably on this 
panel and who are listening, we're we're leaving that era of global liberal capitalism and we're entering an era of um, climate change, rising seas, confusion, experimentation, resilience, post-truth, the pluriverse. And kind of what happens next determines if we stay on this path of exploitation, conservation, and release, or can we get to this alpha quadrant and figure out this reorganization, this recommoning that Ronaldo is kind of speaking of. So that's really what we're trying to look at is what are the tools, what are the systems that allow us to do this? And it's not even so much thinking about this idea of, you know, we started with sustainability and now we've transitioned to resiliency in the pandemic, but I think as climate change gets more endemic, we're going to be looking at something that comes from Nic um, Nassim Nicholas Talib, but his term of the anti-fragile. So how can we work with communities and cities and design things in ways that can not resist the changes that are, or not resist the forces that are here, but can absorb them, learn from them, and not build back better or whatever it is, but build in a way that you're able to survive and live with the resources in the city um, that you have it. Um, Jenny O'Dell is someone that we read, so capitalist, colonialist thinking, um, loneliness and an abusive stance toward the environment all co-produce one another. Um, highly recommend that book, How to Do Nothing. She's an artist and a professor at Stanford. Um, you know, the, 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 the maintenance art manifesto from the, from the late 60s from Mario Latum and Nucleus is something we think about. So we're kind of in this position right now where we have to choose between the death instinct and the life instinct. And the death instinct might be those kind of accoutrements that go outside kind of like corporate plazas and, and condominium buildings that artists are designing and making, but then in a climate change era and an era of a global pandemic just become this kind of urban flotsam and jetsam that no longer really fulfills its roles. Um, so what going back to the garden, um, the house Shui, some alum, the new growth. Um, so you can see it, it was designed by Cis to have a kind of a Coast Salish design motif um, with kind of an interlocking series of semicircles, trigons, and crescents. The birds can see that, and it's Coast Salish design for the birds, but you feel it as you walk through. But she was also trying to think about, because it's situated in Chinatown, um, some Taoist imagery. And then Oliver Barnes um, is, is, a, is a member of the youth, so I'll give a shout out to Nicole Kelly Westman, who's our education and learning programmer and an artist. And she works at the site with the series Series of youth who steward it and program it. Um, but there's Oliver Barnes, Jazz Whitford, um, Solomon Chinique, um, and and um, and there's one more, Oliver and Valine Jewels as well. Um, and that's Oliver who's planned a kind of um, a, um, uh, a reflexology path for the garden because nothing like this exists in the neighborhood in Chinatown. And so that was kind of the major project he's been working on over the past year is to kind of put this in and we'll be opening it very soon. Um, and that's Bridget Lockheed who is teaching him the masonry skills. But it's something that we really just tried to encourage him to build. Um, there wasn't a tremendous amount of permitting process. This is actually private land that's donated to us. Um, and so we just have to kind of get the approval of the landowner to kind of do what we need, but he's pretty much encouraging a lot of this space. And I think it's also, we can kind of carry forward this, you know, what Brian McVeigh at 22NA would carry forward in the, intangible cultural heritage of Chinatown is this kind of brown paper bag regulatory space because of the way that Chinatown had to emerge as a society through its um, through the anti the Asian and racist laws that the city of Vancouver and the government of Canada had placed on it, meaning that um, Asian identified peoples could not own property or operate businesses. So essentially benevolent societies had to be established where um, families would uh, and communities would pool resources, open up a nonprofit society, and that nonprofit society could then do the business, um, but they were constrained by nonprofit and society laws at the same time. So this tension and, and, and this kind of racist planning that the city of Vancouver and the government of Canada enacted on the neighborhood developed a space that was regulatorily this kind of gray zone where you don't kind of ask what's behind the envelope sometimes because it might open up a whole issue of problems. And so how do we kind of keep this, this kind of problemic kind of at the center of 221A? Um, we're kind of thinking through now, and this is something we're trying to do is we're launching a cultural land trust. Um, so this land trust, we're trying to give birth to another organization essentially. So it's not something 221A will do, um, but it might be the first example of it in Canada. Um, and so essentially this will be a, a, an organism and a tool that can an, assemble properties um, for cultural use. And as, as, a, as a kind of 
platform for nonprofits and cultural organizations, we can use that to better lobby for the kind of regulatory taxation and kind of um, zoning uh, agreements that we need. Whereas individual organizations who are small nonprofits in the city and in this environment just don't kind of make the impact that they used to in the 20th century or can't that community support behind one location or one organization's mission doesn't quite do it, but recognizing the need across the whole region, um, can we get together and do this? Um, so that's what we're thinking about. We'll be releasing a business plan and an anti-racism plan for this cultural land trust later in the spring, so stay tuned. Um, but the city of Vancouver has so far committed um, plus $5 million at least um, for the seed uh, funding for it. And we'd be looking to grow it over the next um, 10, 15 years to have a capitalization of approximately 80 to $120 million um, dollars in kind of capital property assets. Um, the vision by 2050 would to have, be to have security of tenure um, for about 30 um, organizations um, within the city of Vancouver. Um, and what's very important for this is, you know, how we looked at that first slide and those kind of layers of the kind of the, the land um, agreements and laws and uh, deeds and those sorts of things. And so we're planning this, but through the anti-racism planning at the same time, we have to recognize that, you know, there will be a shadow covenant within this land trust that says that our parchment with the city of Vancouver may not be valid at some point. And so that essentially we have to look and we have to plan this thing so that it is led and governed with um, the host nations here, the, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and, and the Tsleil-Waututh, and that at some point they may become the leaders of this land trust and we will work to make that possible with them. Um, and we're seeing many examples of how this is happening across the city. Um, essentially, you know, I think there's Sanak, which is a, a Squamish nation development on Squamish land, um, just south of the Granville Street Bridge. Um, and this land is being developed by the Squamish nation. It's being developed outside of the city of Vancouver's code. Um, they will be collecting their own taxation on that land to provide for resources for the nation. Um, but at the same time, they're working with a developer called West Bank, who's built some of the most notorious condominium projects around, around the city. So um, what I mean by this unceded territory question being left in the gap here in the city of Vancouver, it's like in these arenas and at these scales at which it's being negotiated and debated and, and realized as actual infrastructure now. Um, so we would like to have a model or a tool that can kind of bring us into these. Um, we just opened our very first housing facility for artists um, in partnership with the city of Vancouver and what's called the Community Land Trust, which is a housing land trust. Um, and this is the very first time the city of Vancouver has developed this property. So it's a community amenity property. Um, it is not just studios. It has living space. It has kitchens. It has bathrooms. It has disabled space. Um, and essentially, um, there's 30 units in this building for artists and for low, for mid, mid, low to middle income artists. Um, and and we had to learn how to become kind of a housing provider very quickly um, because this property was actually going to be operated by what was known as BC Artscape, but they ran into capacity issues throughout the pandemic and it very quickly had to go into our, um, into our operation and we had to learn how to do this. So we're kind of learning as we go and um, we're being supported by the land trust and we had to set up a separate nonprofit called the um, 221A Artist Housing Society to manage this, to kind of create a new charitable purpose that will provide for housing. Um, it provides for housing for artists who make and their families who make between twenty and fifty thousand dollars a year for a household income, and it was tenanted through um, an equity matrix that prioritized Black, Indigenous, racialized, disabled, queer, and trans peoples. Um, and then after that, it was a lottery system because essentially, for these thirty units, we received over four hundred applications. So for the need for this kind of housing is great. It is endemic, and we are imploring the city of Vancouver to keep going with us. We have a charitable model, and we have a charitable platform to keep doing this with them. Um, this is a speculative drawing of something that we're looking ahead at, but we haven't quite come to an agreement on. Um, but this is um, a co-development that we would like to do with the Chinese Benevolent Society, um, kind of reimagining their space, providing better space. We work with Chinese Benevolent Societies. They rent to us um, for studio space and for other um, uh, kind of nonprofit retail space. Um, however, uh, you know, the conditions that these buildings are in are not great. They're very poor. And as the seniors in the neighborhood, there are elders, and we've always been looking for ways to give back to them um, and for ways to kind of improve their conditions. Um, so what's been well, ever since I joined the team at 221A in 2015 for one of the buildings we've worked at with the Benevolent Societies, it's been a like six, seven year, maybe it's been a 10 year process just trying to get a new fire alarm kind of system permitted from the city. And so these kind of negotiations 
associations with these societies take an incredible amount of time. So it's thinking about that longevity of space for, for that cu cultural work to actually happen. And so this may be a development that could happen in five, 10 years time, but we'd be looking at doing something with them where we were using some of the space, maybe on a long-term lease for a hundred years, but essentially they would still own the property and they would still kind of tenant it um, with their membership as well. Um, Another project that we're thinking about in the neighborhood that would grow from the garden is one of our fellows, Christina Battle. Um, she's thinking about mesh networks. And so a mesh network is a network that's developed um, as a kind of free acting agent, kind of like a, like, a, like a fungus. It kind of reaches out looking for resources and where it's healthy and it finds them, it'll continue to grow. So this mesh network could be ostensibly become kind of a free Wi-Fi network for the downtown east side Chinatown area, which we're looking at developing. Um, that comes out of the pandemic needs, but it also comes out of the way that people in the neighborhood receive Wi-Fi from storefronts um, and from under awnings. But after business hours, uh, you can still receive the Wi-Fi, but it also makes you a target for the VPD for stop and search. So can we provide Wi-Fi in regions where there is not this, um, where the VPD do not have the, the protocols to stop and search people like in our park, in the laneways? Um, they only do so if you're on quote unquote private property. Um, but if we can recreate common property that has this access, and it might be a different way, but it's also an interesting way to think about the existing networks within the neighborhood and how we can kind of work with them to develop this system. So we're just getting through the research phase of this now, and Christina is gonna be working on this with us over the next, co next couple of months to kind of plan it out. And we'll be having some uh, greater discussions in public about what this means. But for now, we're just having very local discussions with um, kind of existing networks to kind of think about how we can grow our mesh network. Um, you might've heard of mesh networks is a very strong one in Detroit. Um, and they were very strong during the Umbrella Revolution and um, subsequent protests in Hong Kong when the government of Hong Kong would shut down a kind of internet service. Um, and that just brings me to the digital side of what we're doing. We have a digital strategy called Blockchains and Cultural Padlocks. Um, thank you to Friends with Benefits and Cedric Payne, one of their curators here in Vancouver, um, who did these beautiful gifts with us. Um, and essentially um, what the strategy is looking at doing is we're looking at this new economy that's emerging um, through cryptocurrency, through the sharing of digital assets. Um, but it is not going to be just these kind of computerized posters, which are called NFTs, which are shared as assets. This is going to develop and evolve and we're going to be learning how to kind of share our cities and design and manage our cities with this kind of shared asset thing. So the permitting office at of the city and the mortgaging office at of the bank are going to be challenged in terms of the power they hold in determining on how the city develops. And essentially communities are going to find ways to better provide for themselves, to self-organize around neighborhoods, to build their own infrastructures. And this is going to be happening more and more as the civic infrastructure declines and prioritizes things like master plan developments um, and as climate change kind of intensifies. So we're looking at digital cooperativism kind of as that as that kind of fulcrum around this digital strategy. Um, we're working Another one of our fellows is a distributed housing cooperative that could work at city scale called DOMA that's coming from Kiev. And so we're looking at their applicability for cities like Vancouver or kind of North American cities where development is prioritized. Um, and then on the, on the right there is another, um, it's a, a still from the McConnell Foundation's um, Leg Legitimate Cities kind of publication from 2019, kind of looking at the ways that communities can better um, harness the infrastructure that actually makes up their, 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 their urban spaces. We're very much inspired by Dimeji um, Onafua, who's a designer who looks um, at, at recommoning. Um, uh, Ronaldo, if you don't know him, I'd, I'd be happy to send you some, some, some texts and some links from him. But these recommoning principles are, are him looking at the way the digital platforms will be a, the way that we can kind of reclaim common space. Um, and he's using very much traditional kind of cultural values to think through how we design um, these digital layers to the cities that we live in. And then finally, the work that we're doing to kind of propel this digital strategy. Of course, this is speculative five, 10 years out stuff, but we really want to handle on this trajectory. So it's really like our work is looking at the modeling, the sensing, and the counter mapping of the city. And then on the bottom left um, and the top right, um, there's kind of two research pieces there. 
um, from DOMA, our fellow, and we're working on a dashboard with them that is showing us how we've had lost access to the housing in our city um, since 2006. And so when we release that, you'll be able to see a kind of, you'll be able to see where you, your access to the city is through your income um, and how that has changed over the years. And that'll be both for buyers and renters. Um, and that's just an early tool for us to start to visualize and to model this. And we've done away with a single plot kind of property idea of kind of 20th century cities. And we're using the design methodology of the kind of COVID or the forest fire hotspot to talk about property access. Um, and then on the bottom right, um, countermap.land is a great project that we're doing with the Artist Run Center Association of Canada and um, the Architecture Lobby's Toronto chapter. So there's a great group to get involved with um, around property um, in the city of uh, Toronto. But essentially countermap.land is gonna be a space where we can recognize um, the colonial and racist spaces and many layers across the city. We can start mapping them and identifying them. And stay tuned, there'll be several workshops coming up in 2021 um, in Toronto for you to take part in as well around the counter map land processes, as well as, as well as across the country, including here in Vancouver. Um, so maybe I can just leave it there and then we can um, dive into a rich conversation together. Thank you. Max, can you put us back into gallery view, please? Maybe we are. Well, first, um, thank you so much to the panelists. Um, such amazing presentation, so many thoughts and intersections of ideas happening in my mind. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, impressed by and I'm also I'm thinking about the trajectory of all of the of this entire um, panel how we began in a parquette with Amy and then moved into thinking about institutions and institutional structures and now have landed in this and literally in this digital space um, and, and bringing it all back to how public art operates in these intersections so Thank you all for drawing these wild connections and uh, having and starting this um, conversation that we've been having for quite a long time. And I think now what we would like to do is open it up to questions. We have some questions um, already for the panelists, as well as we invite questions from the audience. And we also invite the panelists to um, present questions to each other in this moment. Yeah, but maybe um, I sh I'll begin with, oh, and to ask a question, you're welcome to plot them in the chat, but I also recommend using the key, uh, the Q&A feature. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question um, here from Park, Park MacArthur. Amy, maybe I'll just, um... oh, from Jason. <laughs> um, Amy, I'm just gonna start with, or... Or Annie, I'm just going to start with that question. Is that that's cool? Um, so this question um, is for Jesse, which Jesse, I'm sure you can see this, but I'm just going to read it out for everyone. Um, thank you, Jason. So in response to the um, land trust and to the housing um, project that 221A is working on, um, the question is: There are units. Are there units in the building that are leased at market rate, and if so, how many? I ask because housing resources are often not conceivable outside the system of private property, meaning that commons are often necessarily conceived of as a minor autonomous zones and would be interested to hear the panelists thoughts on how a dream of commoning could be possible as a majority and what forms public resources might take in that situation. Great question. Thank you. Should I answer the nuts and bolts kind of part of it first? Is that good? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, there are, that's how the city of Vancouver develops all of its non-market housing, essentially, is um, for the most part, it's kind of found within kind of market housing um, facilities. Um, I don't have the percentages of the market to artist housing in that facility. I'm, I'm not deeply involved in the housing side of it. And we've just hired a cultural planner to kind of lead that with us. Um, but I can report back I, if there's an email or something. I'm happy to find that information and send it out. 
if I if I may, um, I think one thing that we should um, not take for granted is the idea that housing has always been tied to something called private property. Um, that's not particularly the case. But having said that, you know, part of the challenge here is, you know, um, reordering how it is that we understand what housing is. And so, you know, there are many advocates who talk about housing as a human right. Um, I'm less interested in housing from that sense, but what I'm, what I'm interested in is an understanding of housing where housing is not financialized. And this is the, the significant problem, at least in the wealthy overdeveloped West where housing is radically financialized. So I think like, you know, um, some of the initiatives that Jesse talked about are really, really interesting to me and really compelling. But I guess one of the things that it raises for me is how those initiatives still sit inside of the ongoing rapaciousness of capital and the way in which capital um, finds new ways of extending its life and its life cycle. So, you know, these developments that have within them what we call affordable housing or housing for particularly identified communities like artists who make a certain kind, uh, a, a certain level of income and so on. Um, these, are, these are important compromises, don't get me wrong. They're important compromises, but they don't break, they don't fundamentally break the chain of how capital continues to organize our lives in really substantive ways. And that substantive way is this kind of question of how all of what it means to live a life is becoming financialized. And so that's the challenge that I think that we're faced with. Um, how do we break this tremendous, this tremendous enclosure of financialization that is literally reshaping what it means to be a human being? Yeah, I think that um, just to respond to this idea of like, you know, in certain developments, there's a certain percentage of quote unquote affordable housing. When I was in my presentation, I talked about um, 315 Spadina, which was a new proposal. It hasn't been built yet, proposed in 2019. And what, instead of the mural that the developers had originally proposed, what was landed on in those negotiations was to um, have 10% affordable housing in that development. And, and, you know, from the perspective of me and other activists, it's like, this is not a win. But from the perspective of the city, they're like, you know, the progressive councillors are like, this is amazing. This like rarely happens, et cetera, et cetera. And then you see things like inclusionary zoning coming in in Toronto where it's like, okay, well now all developments have to have a certain percentage of affordable housing. And I think, you know, part of what that does is it, it basically justifies more development, right? It justifies um, the raising of more neighborhoods and, and basically this continual cycle of like property speculation. Um, yeah, so I'm really, I guess I'm really interested in, you know, the idea of a land trust model and just thinking about like, that in relation to Jesse, what you talked about, about the benevolent societies first taking place as nonprofits because they needed to evade a certain kind of law. And I, yeah, I'm just curious because land trusts in Toronto now are also becoming more popular. Um, and I'm just curious about, you know, this idea of like, okay, operating within a certain system that is, you know, condoned by the city versus doing something that is, um, um, I don't know, I guess I'm, try, I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to say, but the nonprofit or the benevolent societies using the law in a wrong way, um, using it against itself in some way. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll be, this is, we're just getting going on, on that front and we're planning those land trusts, you know, for 50, 100 years. So it's kind of like TBD, what happens with it. But I agree too on the digital front that a lot of these things can be, yes, tools that can be used for good can be used for bad. That's just the, the nature of, 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 of humanity as we've known it. And it's kind of like, there are very negative and scary examples of how this technology could be used, where, you know, you could 
create micro rents so that for lower income neighborhoods, you do not have to pay rent at the end of the month, you have to pay it every day. And then if you're not paying that day, then you could be evicted. These sort of things could happen. Um, smart buildings can exist where there's noise level sensors in your building so that if you exceed the noise levels after a certain hour, you could be automatically fined. So there's all kinds of um, property technologies that are terrifying about how they're going to further enclose the city. But I think at where we're at right now in terms of this digital economy developing that is outside of the fiat system or beyond the fiat system. And this, you know, I think there's kind of like 10, 15 years as infrastructure is being born. Um, or no, there's kind of 10, 15 years where technology is being born and then it kind of solidifies as infrastructure. And so now is the time around this new economic system is to get involved, think about designers, think about systems, think about processes with communities that'll enable us to get there first and show it that something is working. And I think in this era of the Anthropocene back loop, um, if you're able to create things that are anti-fragile and working, communities will just start using them. And I think this is a very big example that's also coming from the global south around this kind of technology and this digital economy is that it's, it's already superseding existing national economies in some ways because it is more reliable and because it is more, it is more trustworthy than what currently exists in terms of financial systems. Um, and so, there's there's lots to come from it, and you know we're working with there's some great designers like um, Francis Sang who's working with Doma who er, developed an early protocol called Bail Block, which was basically you could raise cryptocurrency just by browsing the internet, and that would go directly to a number profit, the New Inquiry Journal, and they would use that to pay down kind of basically detention bonds for people who've been kidnapped by ICE. And so you can use these things um, to do good things. So I don't want people to get kind of just deterred from the negative press and the kind of multi-user sensory hallucination that occurs on web 2.0 feeds like Twitter and Facebook that kind of like vilify or kind of create the situation where academics would look at this kind of technology and just call it the devil's hammer because that's what they've read on Facebook in that way. Interesting. Did you want to add some thoughts, Heather, or? Oh, I know, I, um, I was just gonna ask if you wanted to Go to the next question from the Q, in the Q and A, or if you wanted to respond to this thread. I mean, it's all related, but um, I did want to sit a little bit on this question about um, the idea of, of a land trust because, yeah, as you said, Amy, it is kind of this idea of a land trust as an alternative to private property is starting to percolate in um, urban discourse. And also, I was wondering if Amy, you could talk a little bit about the history of land trusts and how they emerged in um, North America. If you remember, because I remember that you did a very good presentation. No, you don't want to talk about it. I know. <laughs> okay. Anyway. I think people can look that up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. But I like this idea of think of like uh, the question of land trust as um, Ronaldo, you were saying an idea of an invented resource, but also an invented model that we can share to build um, commons. And I think um, linking to the question, we only have a, a few minutes left, but linking to the question of like, what are alternative models, especially to things like private property and housing, like we've seen during the pandemic, massive housing strikes. And we've seen from those, um, the rents are rent strikes that we've seen from the from those rent strikes, a dream of other models and ways of being together and that conversation um, happening. And so I would like that conversation to enter into this space and ask uh, what are alternative ways of being together? What kind of alternative um, models do you see that the arts can take on and what are, um, and how do our artist run centers also dream, be part of the dream of abolition? Is there anything um, that you would like to add, Heather? No, <laughs> that was perfect, thank you. Should I, should I go? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, when I think about the question of abolition in relationship to, um, in relationship to things like housing, um, one of the things that, that I think a lot about is how housing has to be liberated from the market as, as a part of a process of 
transforming how we live better together. You know, and, and, and what I mean by that is that it, it's actually really in the wealthy overdeveloped West that housing has become this particular kind of network system that allows for the trans the, the, that allows for the transference of wealth. So this is why again we can begin to see why, for instance, in major cities like Toronto, Vancouver, you know, um, and 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 across the U.S., that the people who are without houses are again black and indigenous peoples. That that this is by no means that the significant numbers are by no means this is by no means an accident. This is an outcome of the very system that has traded in those particular peoples as outside of the system that it wanted to build as a legitimate system. And so I, my, 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 my kind of position here is that any process that begins to take housing outside of market logics is a process that also is involved in beginning to transform the way in which capital organizes our social lives. And so for me, the kind of question then is, what does that look like? And where might we begin that process? And, and I guess like one way to begin that process is for communities to be able to regain autonomy over the territories within which they're living. And, and that means then that, you know, a redistributed model of how territory is governed, are proportioned, um, built up, how infrastructure plays itself out, begins to be returned to a very, at the very basic community level. Um, what we have now are, are a series of structures that I think both Jesse and Amy spoke to that actually takes away the possibility, the democratic possibility of communities to shape what happens in the spaces that they inhabit. So again, you know, what I'm, or what I'm suggesting might seem to some people more utopic than practical, but actually there are a number of places and communities that begin to do these things outside of the regime of legitimate, of legitimate legislation and law. And I think what we're faced with is how can we proliferate those things that are happening? Um, so that's, that's my, my two cents there. Yeah, I think the utopian is still important. You can't, you can't, I mean, we want to create an image that people can, can work towards, right? You want to create, and it's not a, it's not an extraordinary image. It's a livable city. It's a livable city where people can live their lives, where the right wing is imagining futures that include space apartheid and like a face tracking metaverse. So I would say like they do, an, the right wing does a tremendous job at creating these images that will allow for their constituencies to work towards and become violently kind of riled up for. So how do we in our side kind of create cities or images or utopian conspiracies that allow people to build towards just a livable city? We don't need to live on the moon. We do not need to live in the metaverse, you know? I'm also seeing we are at time, but I am seeing two questions. Is it okay if we give five minutes for these two questions? Yeah. Heather, do you want to share them? Yeah. Um, so the first question from Heian Kwan. Um, thank you for this incredible talk. This question might be more for Ronaldo, but I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts. I'm reminded that the very definition of self is entangled with the notion of private property as modern law posits an individual law as quote, one who owns himself. What are your thoughts on different definitions of the self that's separate from self-ownership? And, and maybe I'll just throw out the second question as well and, and um, just to put in the mix, um, a really important question from an anonymous attendee that says, hello from Treaty 7 Blackfoot Territory. Where does land back sit in all of this? Yeah, I would say first we have to recognize that that particular definition of self 
is a definition of self that comes from the European Post Enlightenment, from the European Post Enlightenment project. And that's only one particular worldview of a definition of self. Um, indigenous peoples around the world have different definitions of self. Um, even the people who were enslaved and forced to live to the routines of enlightenment modernity had different definitions of self. You know, when Toni Morrison in her, in her great novel, Beloved, opens that book with a tremendous act of the taking of life of a child. That's a different definition of self. And it's a definition of self that um, continues to shape Black Dye's court life. So having said all of that, part of what I'm gonna say then is that there are other worldviews of how we might organize life that are still with us. For example, you can take the way in which um, Leanne Beata, Beata Smoke Simpson writes about um, her people's cosmology in as we always were, as still instantiating an entirely different worldview. What we are witnessing in BC among the Wet'suwet'en is also another worldview that is still with us with an entirely different definition of self. So one of the things that the kind of work that I try to do is, is to push back against the idea that European enlightenment, European um, um, post-enlightenment modernity is the only way in which we can make sense of the world. That not all understandings of self immediately tied to the ownership, the ownership of the self as a kind of individual category that then leads to property and private property and privatization of life. That there's still among us many ways of conce conceptualizing what it means to have a self that is collective, that is tied to other organisms, both living and non-living, and, and that those are the places and the forms of knowledge that we need to proliferate in these times of numerous and multiple reoccurring emergencies. I think I would also add that when you think, like I think the idea of possessing yourself is a very, is, is a very powerful idea, but it actually doesn't line up with reality. Like in your own personal experience of the world and of your life, like, do you feel like you own, I don't know, like an avatar that you're moving through the world and that you're like, you know, encountering obstacles and then jumping over like in a video game, like no one actually feels that way. The experience of being alive is so much more weird and connected to so many other things. And I think it's like part of what both Jesse and Ronaldo are saying, this constriction of an imagination and this constriction of our world that in allows us to start believing that, oh, now, you know, uh, I'm a person who owns myself and I have to control everything about myself and all my time must be like ordered in this kind of way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's an internal and external kind of battle. And I think, yeah, it's about inter interdependence. And um, for us, it's really like even getting beyond the idea that you can make your own neighborhood is like so far beyond younger generations capacity because everything comes pre-made, bricked, ready built and like unalterable. Um, so, you know, there's there's a real lack of kind of neuroplasticity in a lot of our minds about how you do this or you become very fearful because we do not have the experiences or the feedback that it's even possible. So I think what we're trying to do at 221A really is change our neuroplasticity to find ways as a collective, as a community um, to have this agency and, and, and to regrow these parts of our brains that do exist and are incredibly creative and interdependent and interlocked with the people and the other beings and the systems we live within but we've just been so disconnected over 150 years of you know racist capitalism essentially just briefly to the land back question i think you know um my way of thinking about that is through this notion of a renewed commons. That um, the question of land back um, is one way of naming um, the problem in, in Turtle Island, but the question of land back or land back or renewed commons takes different names in different parts of the world and different parts of the globe. 
And that this kind of question of the earth's resources is a question of land back, um, to use that kind of language, which is to say that it's a question of how are we going to not just be stewards of the natural resources of the earth, and as I said, the invented resources as well, but how are we going to re-implant the species that we call human as a part of all of planetary life, uh, that the species we call human, if we might be the most significant predator, but we are also a part of the organisms that make up the planet. And you know, the radical move is to begin to think of ourselves as such and then figure out how to live as such. Thank you so much, Ronaldo, Amy, and Jesse. Um, and thank you for everyone who joined us and for the wonderful questions that we received. Um, Annie, do we have any specific <laughs> closing remarks other than, yeah, thank you everyone for extending this conversation that we've been having, as, as Annie said, internally at TPW. It's been really, really nice. Um, Ronaldo, Amy, Jesse, we've been you know talking about all of the work that the three of you do for a long time here. And it was really, I'm just gonna speak for Annie and myself to say really, really rich um, and nice to, to hear from you all together. Um, so thank you again. Yeah. And thank you so much, Max, who organized this, um, who's organizing the tech for this today and, and providing lots of support. So thank you, Max, who is here with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for this deep conversation. As I said earlier, like these questions of how to move through public space in these times have been on our minds. And so bringing community together, learning from each other and building our relationships um, in this way of, of conversation, I feel I'm, I'm incredibly, grateful to know all of you and to have this space and for Heather for being so awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.